So if I can just get a sense of the mix of what we've got, um, we're obviously uh, mostly talking about this world of apprenticeships in, in my uh, talk. How many of you are currently delivering apprenticeships? Vocational learning in general, so not specifically apprenticeships. And here for uh, FE and HE. Cool, so real mix. I'll try and, I don't think it's too apprenticeship specific, but we'll try and make, you know, make sure it works. Um, so that's the title of the talk. Um, we've always done tech, technical education, so I'll talk about that in a mo. Um, but it was missing the bit of actually how do we teach in, in a tech way. Um, yeah, as, as Chris said, um, I'm director now of our degree apprenticeship programs at QA, which started about two, two and a bit years ago. Um, I've worked in apprenticeships for, like, as Chris said, for like, it's probably more than that now, 15 years. I've worked in it where it was poorly funded, unfashionable, and no one cared about it. And it's a bit of a weird situation that, at least in the UK, suddenly some of those things are changing. So nice time for us. Um, has anyone come across QA before? Been on a QA training course? Prince 2 or something. Um, the background of QA, and it is different, I guess, to, uh, to some of the other speakers you'll have today, is we're a commercial private training business. Um, we started in the mid-80s, really alongside the PC boom, is suddenly everyone started, particularly at work with companies, PC started appearing, and actually there was a huge opportunity at that point to start training. Um, so we started in tech, it's still our heritage. It was IT, now it's tech. Um, and, uh, and got to the point really of being a market leader in that short course. So everything was up to a five day training course. Uh, huge variety of courses, 1500 different titles, but all delivered in that same way. Um, and then in 2008, we had a change of leadership. Um, uh, William McPherson, our current CEO, came from a background at Kaplan, big accountancy business, um, and moved us into that broader picture of being a training and education business. And so the two things we added were an apprenticeship division and a higher education division in 08. Um, the interesting thing about all of this is uh, when I talk to people at Instructure, uh, that story of growth is incredibly similar. So we started our apprenticeship business in 2008 <laughs> Um, we've gone from nothing to actually five and a half thousand apprentices on program in what's that, nine years. Uh, I started in uh, 2011 and we've now got more staff than we had apprentices when I started. So it's, uh, it's uh, and the context for that is trying to uh, both keep the wheels on every year as you're growing and also to innovate is the challenge I think that we uniquely face. I often talk about working in a high growth business as being like, you know, it's like dog years. So a year in a normal business is like seven in a high growth business because you're trying to do all of those things all at once. So have mercy on us when you see where we've got to. Keep that in mind. Uh, we're very proud of our Ofsted grade one as I'm sure the guys at Grimsby are. Um, that was a 2013 thing, so I can't say that anything of that's to do with blended learning. Um, and we haven't been seen for a while, which is the other benefit of a grade one. <laughs> so this was us. Um, we delivered high-tech skills in a very low-tech way. Um, and, uh, you know, high-tech skills, you know, talking about um, presentations earlier, you know, we're teaching people stuff around uh, high-end cybersecurity, Internet of Things stuff, big data, analytics, machine learning, stuff that is at the pretty close to the cutting edge of stuff, not necessarily all in apprenticeships, but across the business. But we're doing it in the absolute most traditional way of face-to-face -face learning. 12 people in a room, monitors in between them and the lecturer. But actually it was really, that was it. That was our model. Uh, in apprenticeships, you had the face-to-face -face learning bit, plus you had a, an assessor or a skills coach going out to do one-to-one face-to-face. -one -face. But that was still one-to-one face-to-face and that there was no technology joining the journey up. Um, and so I stand in front of you humbly saying that's you know, the sort of place we were. It's classic builder's houses scenario. We really should have known better, but the reality is high growth business, keeping the wheels on. We just kept doing what was working. You will still find people in our business today who say the future is face-to-face -face learning. It's never going to die. And it sounds a bit like a blockbuster moment to me when people say that. 
Um, so what started our move towards blended learning was um, uh, we started looking at degree apprenticeships in QA, and uh, I think we are pretty good at designing around our customers. And so when we went to talk to them about what do you need a degree apprenticeship to look like, and we're talking about people who've done a lower level apprenticeship program, stayed in the same company, but then wanted to progress to get a degree. Um, and the things they said is, you can't take them out of the workplace. You can't take them out every Friday. You can't take them out for a week at a time every term. They're too valuable to us. We're struggling to recruit technical talent anyway. And if, you, uh, yeah, if it's got this high face-to-face -face content, forget it. It's not going to work. So that was, our that was really our imperative that what pushed us to get started. Um, there are other things uh, like, please, can you teach year-round? Um, we don't want a big summer break. We don't want a massive deadline build up in sort of January and May. That doesn't suit our business at all. We need you to, to work the, the whole academic timetable to suit us as a business. So there's that as well. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, so we hadn't really done blended learning, like I said before. Um, we spent six months using our old, uh, uh, our director of ITs here, hello Mike, uh, spent six months using uh, our old, uh, an LMS that we used effectively in our corporate business, which was really just to deliver SCORM-based e-learning to customers and to know that they'd done it. Um, and we used that for six months, and that was bad. Really bad. But thankfully, because degree apprenticeships were so new, we only had about 30 apprentices on program. So we sort of managed to limit the limit the damage for a while. But it was it was abundantly clear that we needed to do something different. I think our our great uh, benefit was that we started without having an incumbent VLE that was a huge you know huge ship to turn around. So I think from the moment we signed the contract to opening the box on Canvas and starting using it was like eight weeks, which I know is unusual, but um, <laughs> that's partly because we're completely unencumbered by any other problems of integrations, etc. And that is uh, maybe the story of starting very small. Um, and because we started small, we only had this one team, my team of degree apprenticeships using it. Um, uh, and, and I look back on this, this was definitely naivety on my part that we didn't think about any of this stuff, like any of the grand ideas that we should have had. Um, we literally, on a, uh, the first week of January, got the team together, switched it on, gave them passwords and told them to start, go hack. And it was like a hackathon for a day, two days. Um, uh, yeah. I, this is me, again, that moment of going, telling you the things we did, right or wrong. Um, the thing I like about it when we look back is it did just break very quickly the barrier of actually overthinking what they needed to put into their new courses, is they just got started. And the fact that everyone was in a room together for a period of time, that little idea of hot housing going, I can't, that doesn't look right, I can't get that to work. Have you seen this bit of functionality? I think we continue to find bits of functionality in Canvas every day, every week that we haven't thought of. Um, and I think some of that, but that was a, a really, it was a good start for us. Um, but yeah, you couldn't do it on a big scale. Um, actually, I'll just go back with one. Um, I've heard this, I think, in every talk so far, is the second phase gets harder. You always get your early adopters. Um, I think um, when I listen to probably the difference for us is we're quite, uh, quite a centrally controlled, probably quite a hierarchical commercial business. So we have this idea that uh, a small group of people develop content and they develop it centrally and then that gets pushed out because we're a UK-wide business. A key thing of what we're trying to do is to make sure we deliver a consistent experience. We've got well, we've got 12 different centres in major UK cities, and a key thing for us is trying to make sure that when it gets out there, it's the same for everybody. I think, uh, so we haven't had that uh, initial thing about how do we think about getting everybody on board. We've almost had get a really small group on board so far. But what we've then found 
increasingly harder is then it does go out into delivery and we're struggling to get that real enthusiasm and adoption because there's a bit of a lack of ownership. They go, well, this guy wrote that content, this guy created this video and it's not mine. And so that I think is a real, uh, when I come on to the late bit, uh, something that we've, um, almost our culture drove us to do it that way, but now we're starting to find the, almost the debt in that approach. going to talk about analytics. Uh, we had a situation where the, the, the hard thing about apprenticeships is they're out in the world. Apprentices are out working in their companies and you don't see them. You don't have loads of contact points and you can't just, I guess, run around the building and find them. I know that's hard anyway. Um, and so what we often found is that you'd have two face-to-face -face courses on apprenticeships that would be spread out. They might be six to eight weeks apart and then we'd have these face-to-face -face assessor or skills coach visits and they might be they're always six to eight weeks apart and so what we found is we had this real time lag in identifying problems with learn with apprentices so either you know their relationship with their employer wasn't going that well they hadn't been turning up that much or actually the classic thing that anyone who's ever been a, an NVQ style assessor is you pitch up uh, you go here's the action plan what have you done and then you get the blank look and nothing. And it's punishing experience when you've trekked around the country to see people and you get nothing. Um, so these big time lags were a real problem for us. Um, analytics has been, I'd say, the biggest part of how we've made Canvas work in an apprenticeship environment. So we, we use the analytics every single Monday morning, uh, Monday afternoon. So we run, the we run through the analytics every Monday morning. And then on Monday afternoon, we have delivery staff on a conference call where we go through the red and amber concerns based on the data. And we do that every week. Um, and that's been huge for us because what we're finding is in a term where we don't have this luxury on a blended learning model of seeing them, we're seeing those that are disengaged and we're seeing them in one week or two weeks. And then we're putting an action plan and then we're chasing them and harrying them. In a 10-week term, if we lose six weeks at the beginning, our experience, and I'm sure everyone's, is we never catch up. So taking the analytics and then in some ways putting this, this rhythm of a, a weekly meeting and a weekly pattern of running the analytics, talking about it, action planning it, and frankly then having a load of people chase up employers and apprentices to ask them what's going on. Um, that's been the biggest thing. Um, it's early days and deg you know, degree apprenticeships are four years long. But I think that's I can draw a direct line between that and the fact that we've retained 96% of our degree apprentices so far. And that's out of a community of about 350 degree apprentices. So it feels statistically valid. The analytics on its own wasn't the answer, but it's about how we then wrapped process and management discipline around it. Uh, yeah, this is... <laughs> I'll, I'll knit my way through this one without offending anyone, I hope. Um, does anyone use uh, NVQ-style e-portfolios in their bits, things like learning assistant, etc.? I think they're rubbish. <laughs> like, 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 all of them are rubbish. Um, is anyone here from Tribal? No, wicked, <laughs> good. Um, <laughs> um, I think this is, there's, there's good and bad here. So we, um, we've still got a little bit of a divide between Canvas being the learning platform. And we've then brought e we've still we already had eTrack as a, as a building a portfolio of competence, but specifically in the very regulated world of apprenticeships. Um, Mike and his team, hello again, Mike. Um, I've done, a, I've done a good job of getting that LTI as integrated as possible. So we've got, uh, we still, we use SpeedGrader primarily as our way of marking all work and getting the data to come across. Um, I've said it a few times, it is loads better that we've got them together, but I, I, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity in the apprenticeship space for Canvas to extend. Um, we'd love for it to be seamless. Um, we'd love to get that really a neat relationship between learning, 
between quizzes, between interactions, the comms, and then ultimately the assessment bit at the back end. So we've got a slightly separated assessment story at the moment. Only slightly. But our apprentices, remember, all work in tech, so they look at this and they're not fooled. They go, that's not the same thing. <laughs> I know it's single sign-on, that's good, but they're like, that's not the same, that's not Canvas. So, yeah. um, and the other thing that I think, uh, now, we've only done this, I would say, on, on that one program, on degree apprenticeships, but we have got to the point where we are 99% paperless. So um, we don't print any materials. Uh, we get over that by having dual monitors in most of our training rooms. And obviously, the general thing about bring your own device and do whatever you want. Um, the interesting thing is I've, uh, I've got an associate dean who works for me who is a classic 30 plus years academic. And, and I, uh, now I interviewed well, I think, but you would still have expected him to be the kind of guy who go, no, you've got to do, you know, there are certain things you have to do on paper the old way. And actually it turned out, it's turned out the other way is he is like a Rottweiler about we will not use paper. So we, we won't print, we'll never print to mark. So every, absolutely everything's on speed grader. Um, second marking, moderation. We've even now got our, because we deliver as in collaborative provision. So we've got our colleagues at the University of Roehampton they now moderate on Canvas um, and the external examiner. So we've got the entire journey to have no paper. And literally, we genuinely don't print any materials. Um, we have 1% of paper left. Does anyone want to guess what the 1% of paper left is? Yeah, the, I, the ILR <laughs> and the commitment statements. Now, we should. I'm going to put Mike a load of pressure now in front of everyone. We should get rid of that first quarter of next year so we get, then can go and say we've actually got at least one program 100% paperless. Um, but that's been a huge for us. I, uh, we should count how many trees we've saved by not printing because we, we always wrote our own material and these manuals that we print every week are like that thick and we haven't printed any for this program for two and a half years which is huge. I think for me, this was, again, just the, the bit of we did just get going. We just started hacking. We didn't really think about this stuff. But probably then a year into this for us, we started to realize that um, one, some of this, uh, the nature of starting to do digital learning, doing digital, actually had a huge impact on uh, the rest of our business. Some forced and some was an opportunity. <coughs> so we, um, I've borrowed this from Bain, the management consultants, not Bain, not, not that guy. <laughs> he doesn't do management consulting, apparently. Be nasty. Um, and I like this because it, it just gave us a way to start thinking about where are we now in our digital journey, but not only thinking about it as a learning piece. So realizing that it's also, above the line, it's the general digital operations. So we still do so many things uh, by a phone call and an email. So fill in the form and email it to us. It's like, um, and then below the line, the things it, it could change for us, it forces us to change our operating model. So um, I, didn't, I should have said actually at the beginning, um, I think we played a high stakes game with, uh, with blended learning, which is we took, because of what employers told us, is we didn't start with, you know, we'd have normally done this over 10 days face to face. We started straight up with, you've got four days, so you can't deliver this content the old way. But it's meant our roles have changed massively for trainers who were used to always being in the classroom, now work remotely, flexibly, they're in the classroom for small chunks, um, they're designing content, they're creating video, and, and the role, the, the change in the skills they need has been huge. Um, and analytics, and then, and then IT, different skills for IT as well, because suddenly we're talking about a primary system that is learner facing as opposed to most of our systems previously being more staff and back end. Um, we've, we've said where we want to get to is this idea that we've got a real seamless online offline experience uh, and, and it's not saying that we're going to become a pure online player. It's a bit like the whole omni-channel retailing for me is actually whilst people set it out as a battle between Amazon and the high street, the reality is that the most successful people in that world are those that do 
seamlessly online and offline, um, where you can buy on the app, look on the app, go into the shop, kick the tires on it, come back out. And that's where we want to get to in terms of using face-to-face -face for the right things, but in a very seamless journey that spans whether you're in or out of one of our buildings. Um, so that's, that's a roadmap that clearly you're not going to be able to you know, take you through all of it, but this idea that it's the wider business change has started to really land for us. Um, and I think the two, the two things that we've identified we're going to have to do now is uh, the first one is to move away from this very content-centric approach to designing courses. So I'm sure, you know, We've always done this. The first thing we do when we've got a new course is write down 10 chapter titles. And it's written down by a trainer. And they go, that's the course. Um, and then we buy a textbook or we write our own textbooks. But what we want to move to is this idea that because we're online, offline, there's so many more opportunities to think about what's the learner experience. And so going away from almost the guy, you know, a trainer sitting in, in his office thinking about a collection of content to actually genuinely sitting down with learners for every new course and saying, tell us about how you experienced the last one. How did you use our content? How do you want to use this? Um, I think the wins we've already had on this, for example, were some of our mandatory courses in tech. Like We forced everyone to do data comms, a networking course. But what we realized it has been designed explicitly for network engineers. And when we started talking to them, the developers said, the developers on a degree of friendship said, I don't care about this stuff. I'm never going to use it. And that was a good early feeling of by getting out and talking directly about learner experience, we started to change some courses because we actually just had people telling us why they didn't like it. Um, and then our next bit, which um, we feel is, is, is going to be a really massive opportunity for apprenticeships specifically, is this idea about challenge-based learning or problem-based learning, but we're talking about challenges. Um, I've always thought like, that magic bit about apprenticeships is where you get applied learning happening, where you learn it, you, you, you learn the new skills, and you immediately apply it to your work context. What we want to do is to try and make that work all of the time. Um, I think we all know challenges where at work you learn, but you learn because you got dropped in the deep end, reference high-growth companies. So it's quite personal to me. But what we want to do is to work through a model where we blend together content, but then with small activities that are like scaffolded practice. But then we create challenges that are longer. And what we want to do is to make people connect structurally the learning they get away from work, effectively, but actually merge that so they bring their work context and they solve real work problems, but in a safe environment. So they're not solving those real world, world problems live. We're giving them the structure, the support, the ability to access content flexibly, but around that core idea that what will hold all of this together, we think, for us in the next few years, is the idea of the challenge through the center of all of our programs and through our courses. So we started doing that. Um, a really nice example is our new data analyst apprenticeship, where we get the single data set all the way through a, an 18-month program that builds and is joined and then adds unstructured data and visualizations and everything. But it all starts and it hangs together throughout the whole program. And that's the sort of example that we're hoping to work out to everything else we do. So that's me. Thank you.